You are listening to Marcus Sahaba Online Radio Podcast. Time of the evening where you join us on Legal Talk. And Alhamdulillah, Mufti A.K. Hussein was, you know, quite vociferous when he told me, Shafat, you know what, if you got any one uh, this Friday, take <laughs> them out. I want... Uh, uh, Advocate Firoz Boda and I want uh, Attorney Yusuf Dakrak on and you know there's a big story going on and let them come on and discuss this issue. I said Mufti Saab, I've already spoken to Advocate Firoz Boda and we've agreed we can have the show but I said you must have our our right hand man also, Attorney Yusuf Dakrak. He said no, 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 they're wonderful they're beautiful people, bring them on so topic uh, this evening people, let me welcome all of you, all of you Attorney Firoz Boda, uh, Advocate Firoz Boda, Attorney Yusuf Dokra, and the listeners were there. Hearty. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <coughs> yes, I can Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa rahmatullahi. Now, the topic of recognizing Muslim personal law in a circular state, conflict and contradiction. Beautiful topic again. Advocate Firoz Boda, there you are. You are see, you have a big file in front of you. It's like going to be a big case this evening. I don't know how you're going to handle it, but <laughs> Alhamdulillah, you know, tell us, how are you doing this evening? Alhamdulillah, I'm fine, Brother Shafat. I hope you're okay and everyone is listening also, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, yeah, we have them all, millions of them around the world. The podcast is going to go all over. And uh, Attorney Yusuf Dokrat, how are you doing this evening? Alhamdulillah, I'm very well, thanks, Brother Shafat. hope you and uh, all the listeners are well. Yeah, our stock rises when your guys are with us. And uh, yes, sir, uh, um, Advocate Firoz Boda, starting off, uh, perhaps you know, give us a summary of what has happened thus far and uh, give us a picture. How deep are we going in this evening? Okay, so I'm going to give you some historical uh, information uh, leading up to the case that was argued yesterday in the Constitutional Court. So in the apartheid era, uh, the apartheid government said that Muslim marriages were illegal because they were potentially polygamous and they were therefore against public policy. So even though it was a contract, the contract was illegal because it conflicted with what you call the bony mores or the the values of the society. And that society was the apartheid society, which was very rooted in Christianity. And because of the what the courts felt was the potentially polygamous nature of a Muslim marriage, because the, the default position, obviously, uh, is, uh, and the position in, in Islam is a man can have uh, four wives. So that offended the morality of the apartheid government uh, and the very concept and notion of polygamy. And therefore, they declared the, the Muslim marriage to be invalid. And what that meant was that you couldn't go to an apartheid court to enforce any rights in terms of Sharia. So what used to happen, there was very evil things uh, in those days. Uh, so, for example, I mean, I know uh, of cases where because the marriage is not recognized, in the case of a divorce, for example, a woman would get her, uh, a, 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 a wife would get her, her her father or some other relative to adopt the children to prevent the father from access uh, access rights. So if the father wanted access rights, he couldn't get it because adoption in terms of, of the apartheid law and in our secular law cuts the relationship between parent and child completely. And that was the consequence of not of not uh, recognizing marriages. S- by the same t- uh, token, uh, Muslim women would not, uh, who wanted maintenance in terms of Sharia during the marriage, if the husband wasn't supporting them, uh, or after the marriage for the for the inter period, uh, or wanted to enforce uh, whatever uh, you know uh, rights that they were given in terms of the Sharia against their husbands, couldn't go to court. And therefore faced injustices because uh, their rights were trampled on and they were not recognized. And so you had uh, an entire system where Muslim marriages were, were being, you know, sort of uh, because of the fact that they were not recognized by the apartheid state, you had all of these uh, injustices that were happening. Uh, so, uh, so, so that gave rise to a call in the new democratic order to recognize Muslim marriages. So it is a very well-intentioned call. 
uh, and, and it had a very, uh, 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 a good, good background of good reasons for the call as to why, why it should be recognized. Uh, so, so then you had, uh, many attempts by the, the government to try and pass or draft legislation. And there was a, uh, initially a, a Muslim personal law bill that was, uh, given out for public comment. And, uh, and, 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 and it, it's, it's sort to recognize Islamic marriages, but if you look at that bill, what it did was then, in, in, in recognizing Muslim marriages, it realized that there's going to be a conflict between the constitution, uh, of South Africa, which is the supreme law of the land, uh, and, and, it, and the constitution says anything in conflict with this constitution is invalid. Uh, any, anything that breaches a bill of rights like the right to e- equality is invalid and therefore cannot be enforced. So, so they recognize the drafters of that bill that there's going to be some tensions between the constitution and, uh, and, 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 and certain provisions of Islamic law looked at in vacuum without the total system of Islamic law being taken into account. And so, so in the, in the draft bill, they sought to introduce certain, uh, uh, things to try and, uh, marry, uh, uh, the, uh, Islamic marriages with the constitution. And that, that really, was an attempt to mix oil with water. Uh, because, for example, one of the things they did was, uh, uh, in, in the bill, and, uh, they basically uh, said that, uh, you know, uh, for, for example, polygamy, you, you couldn't get a, you couldn't get married uh, to uh, a, another woman uh, unless you got court permission, and, and before you got married, uh, the court had to sanction that marriage, and in the court uh, permission process, you need to join your your first spouse, or if you have more than one spouse, your other spouse. Uh, and then uh, you can only get married if the court gave permission. And and if you got married without court permission, you would be uh, liable to a fine uh, of a hundred thousand rands, for example. So that was one example where uh, now already you see the problem here because there's no restriction placed on. Uh, there's a condition of justice in the Quran, but that condition is always left uh, for the men to fulfill after the marriage. It cannot be judged post or prior to the marriage. It's something that the men must fulfill after the marriage. And, and a man, if, he, if, a, if a man fears that he cannot do justice, then, he's, then the Quran commands him only to take one wife. But it's really left. And if you look at the, uh, the practices, uh, of of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba, there was never any uh, evidence even of a Sahaba getting permission from uh, uh, even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to get married uh, to a second wife or, uh, or, or or taking permission from each other. Or and even in the time of the Khulafai Rashidin, it was uh, not something that you had to go to the government before you did this in order to uh, you know to to, to take a uh, take another. Uh, Wife is, uh, uh, is in your marriage, so so the the introduction of the requirement that uh, uh, court permission was required is something that is foreign uh, to Islam when you look at it in a traditional sense, and also the criminalization of polygamy uh, is also foreign to Islam because uh, the immediate conundrum that the law then faces is that if a, a Muslim man in a single marriage has an adulterous affair and takes a mistress, the law doesn't punish him. Uh, but if he takes a second wife without court permission, the law punishes him. So, uh, so uh, adultery is not uh, punished, but uh, but uh, uh, you know uh, polygamy without court permission is punished. Then you had another problem with the draft bill. Is uh, they they basically in the draft bill uh, uh, gave certain grounds for the dissolution of a marriage. Now I'm not an alim, so you take my Islamic knowledge for what it is. Uh, I've consulted with ulama. I have a layman's understanding. You must check what I say uh, with with whoever uh, you know who, who, the, who other scholars are. But but from from my understanding, uh, uh, being part of the faith, you, you can dissolve. An Islamic marriage in a number of ways. Uh, the, 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 the general power is the man has the power of talaq. And we all know how that uh, operates. Ideally, 
in terms of the Quran, you need to separate the talaq over the Indian period. But the scholars say three talaqs issued in one uh, one go is it ends the marriage, and that means that you can't get uh, married again after three talaqs without the wife getting remarried and then divorced. So the the, the usual default position in Islam is that. Uh, marriages are dissolved through a talaq and after the expiry of the Iddid period, then the marriage is dissolved and then the, uh, the parties, if that happens, are free to remarry. So it doesn't require any court intervention or decree of divorce uh, or stamp of approval for the court before the talaq or the marriage is dissolved. Once the talaq is issued and the Iddid period ends uh, and, and, and it's fin- finalized, the marriage is dissolved. It's like a contractual cancellation of a contract. It's, it's the end, and the parties are free to remarry. That's one way of ma- uh, divorcing. The other way of divorcing in Islam is through uh, a khul, right? So the the wife will go to the husband, and she'll say, I want to dissolve the marriage, or I want to annul it by agreement, and they will come into a, a, an agreement, a contract, where, they, where by their agreement they'll decide to dissolve the marriage uh, in return for whatever uh, uh, arrangements they make between themselves. And once they reach this contract, then after the, uh, the khula takes effect in the Eid period, the marriage is ended and that's it. And the third way of dissolving a marriage is through fusk. So if a woman is in a marriage, for example, and her husband does not want to give her a talaq, then the woman in an Islamic system can approach the court uh, and uh, ask the court to dissolve the marriage on recognized grounds. Now, in the secular law, one of the, the, the main ground for dissolving a marriage or, uh, or granting a divorce is if there's an irretrievable breakdown in the marriage. Uh, the court will then grant the divorce. Now here, the, the ground of irretrievable breakdown of a marriage, whether that is compatible with Islam, is a debate. So some some ulama uh, that I've uh, read and consulted uh, say it's fine, it's compatible with Islam. If, the, if there's no love, for example, the, a court can uh, dissolve a marriage. But other, other more stricter ulama say, no, there are certain very strict grounds for, uh, for fisk. Uh, for example, a man is not fulfilling his marital obligations, not supporting, uh, the wife is, uh, you know, ill-treating her and, 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 uh, to, to, you know, uh, which, which, in a manner which is, uh, unacceptable in Islam, then the Qadi will have the right to issue the first, uh, the instance of the wife and dissolve the marriage. So, the, so some of the ulama, and I, I don't know what is right, I'm not a scholar, but some of the ulama who held to strict uh, schools of thought basically said, you can't extend the grounds for first by this broad irretrievable breakdown of a marriage ground. So that's going to lead to a incompatibility between Islam and uh, the law. And then also we have different mazhabs. So how do you accommodate the different mazhabs in the uh, in, in 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 a piece of legislation because when you draft legislation you're going to have to now uh, try and codify the law which is very difficult and then th- that prevents you from judging a case on a case by case basis so that brought about the conflict then another another uh, area of conflict was maintenance after the the dissolution of the marriage so the the, the my layman's understanding is that uh, a man is obliged uh, to support his wife uh, uh, for the Iddah period, and after that, there is no legal duty of support. Uh, there's nothing. So in an Islamic system, after the Iddah period is end, ended, a woman will not be able to sue her husband for for maintenance after the marriage. Uh, whereas in the secular law, there is room for that uh, under the Divorce Act. And so... Uh, some of the things in the in the proposed bill sought to grant women the right to claim uh, uh, benefits beyond the Iddid period from her husband. And now this this was uh, th- this is a form of uh, of uh, uh, you know uh, changing the law, and it's also a form of zulm in the sense that in an Islamic system. There are certain rules. A woman is never left alone in an Islamic system. So if she's divorced. Uh, she can always claim the duty of support from her, her father or her elder brother or her uncle. And if there's nobody there, she can actually claim the duty from the state. The state will have to uh, support her. But in a secular system, you can't go to court and say to the government, 
uh, I am a destitute widow and I want you to pay me maintenance, the government shirks its responsibility. So, so what happens when the government shirks its responsibility to look after widows in the society is that now it must look for some other person to transfer this responsibility to. So beyond the Eid period, they transfer it to the men. Uh, and that is, that is a form of uh, oppression from an Islamic perspective. So here again, you have a conflict between, uh, you know, strict Sharia law and you have a conflict between a bill that now tries to uh, uh, mix and mesh uh, uh, Sharia with, uh, with try, uh, in a form which is now constitutionally acceptable. Then you have the age of marriage. You know, so the bill will set an age of marriage, but in Sharia, there's, uh, once you reach puberty, you are entitled to get married. And, and, and so selecting an age of marriage is now, again, something that is uh, not viewed as uh, consistent with Islam if it is something above puberty. Uh, and, and so these are, these are just some of the examples where the, the bill that was mooted, and, and one of the fundamental problems with the bill that was mooted was that uh, it basically allowed uh, a court to dissolve a marriage uh, where the uh, the judge dissolving a marriage was a non-Muslim judge. So there's a principle in Sharia, and this is what we learned from the ulama. I'm not educated in this, but what, what we learned is that it's impermissible for uh, 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 someone who does not believe in Islam to sit as a judge in a dispute between two Muslims and to dissolve the marriage. It's not recognized in Sharia. The judgment itself is not recognized because the person applying it will not be applying uh, uh, Sharia law or uh, not believing it and therefore the person is disqualified from sitting as a judge in a marital dispute. So how do you, how do you, uh, uh resolve that problem where non-Muslim judges are sitting in, in judgment, uh, and dis- dissolving marriage? Then you have an, you had another tension, uh, because in the secular law, a divorce only takes effect when, uh, when, uh, the court decrees. So you have cases uh, and you've had cases where uh, uh, the, the, the marriage is over because the talaq has been issued and the idda is over and the woman uh, 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 claims maintenance beyond the idda period and the court says, I don't recognize the talaq, the secular court, because the talaq is only effective when I approve it. And therefore it deems the parties who are actually no longer married for purposes of sharia to be married to enforce a claim of maintenance. So all of these uh, difficult, difficult problems uh, occurred as a result of trying to draft a piece of legislation to make it in conformity with the Constitution. So that, that process was jettisoned. So what then happened is that there was, there's a, cert, there, there's a, a lobby group or certain groups within, uh, within the uh, uh, Muslims within South Africa uh, who still want the state to pass this legislation to recognize and regulate Muslim marriages. So then what happened was there were two cases that were taken over uh, and and it were advanced by the uh, by the uh women's legal center trust and uh, there were certain ulama bodies like such as Uksa who supported this application who went to court to basically compel the government to enact legislation to recognize Muslim marriages and here now you had uh, uh, the difference uh, differences between the various groups because you have uh, uh, groups like uh, uh, Legendatul Islam who was one of the parties in the case. Uh, you have like, for example, the Muslim Lawyers Association have been on record saying you cannot uh, recognize, uh, uh, compel uh, government to uh, pass legislation because of all of the problems in trying to harmonize the uh, Sharia with uh, the constitution. And it's like mixing oil and water. You're going to have a clash of values. You're going to have a change in uh, 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 Sharia. You're going to have uh, non-Muslim judges interpreting the Sharia. They don't know Arabic. How are they going to interpret the Quran? How are they going to interpret the Hadith? How are they going to select between uh, Hadith which may uh, which will require reconciliation? You can't do that from a translated book. You can't translate the Sharia into English and enforce it through an English statute. You, it, it, it is unheard of because the Sharia is basically uh, uh, sourced in within the Arabic language, and 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 you can't then interpret the verses of the Quran if you don't know Arabic. Basic stuff like this. So how are judges going to sit and enforce the Sharia 
when they do, they're not even qualified, they don't even understand Arabic, they don't understand the Quran, they don't understand principles of usul al fiqh, they have no access to the to the knowledge uh, uh, that uh, uh, through classical works because they would have it would have to be translated for them. All of these problems, but nevertheless, the Supreme Court, Court of Appeal gave the following order at the instance uh, of the WLC, and the order basically says. Uh, that the Marriage Act and the Divorce Act is uh, declared to be inconsistent with sections 9, 10, 28, and 34 of the Constitution, for example, equality and dignity and, and other rights, in that they fail to recognize marriages solemnized in accordance with Sharia law, Muslim marriages as valid marriages, which have not been registered as civil marriages, as being valid for all purposes in South Africa and to regulate the consequences of such recognition. So the, the Supreme Court of Appeal said... Uh, Parliament is obliged not only to regulate and recognize the marriage, but to regulate the consequences of such recognition. And then uh, they said it is declared that Section 6 of the Divorce Act is inconsistent with Sections 10, 28, 34 of the Constitution insofar as it fails to provide for mechanisms to safeguard the welfare of minor or dependent children of Muslim marriages at the time of dissolution of the marriage in the same or similar manner as it provides mechanisms to safeguard the welfare of minor or dependent children of other marriages that are being dissolved. Then they said it is declared that Section 7.3 of the Divorce Act is inconsistent with Section 9, 10, and 34 of the Constitution insofar as it fails to provide that at the dissolution of a Muslim marriage for the transfer of assets of a spouse in a Muslim marriage where such spouse contributed directly or indirectly to the maintenance or increase of the estate of the other party during the substance of the Muslim marriage either by the rendering of services and the saving of expenses, which would otherwise have been incurred or in any other manner. So here it is, you have a, a, a room to force maintenance beyond iddat and to, to force proprietary consequences of a marriage. Uh, we, Islamic marriages are out of community. Uh, but you have, a, you have a mechanism to divide the estate in an equitable manner if these things happen. It is declared that Section 9 of the Divorce Act is inconsistent with the Constitution uh, as it fails to make provision for the forfeiture of the patrimonial benefits of a Muslim marriage at the time of a dissolution. So in other words, in, in terms of secular law, one person can forfeit the patrimonial benefits of a marriage on certain grounds. And that is a whole issue in Islam. I'm not sure if that even exists. The ulama will be able to advise better. Uh, and, and, and basically then, what the court basically said is that pending the coming into force of legislation or amendments to existing legislation, the court basically said the Divorce Act is applicable to Muslim marriages, the Interstate Succession Act is uh, uh, applicable to Muslim marriages, uh, in short, and, 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 and pending the outcome of this, the... Uh, the, uh, you know, those things will regulate Muslim marriages. Muslim marriages will be recognized and you must enforce your rights through the Divorce Act and the Interstate Succession Act. Now here we, we're gonna start, we're gonna unpack some of the difficulties with this interim order to illustrate some of the inconsistencies. But that's the background. That's where we are. So you have two schools. One saying, you can't, you, you can't, if you're gonna recognize Muslim marriages, you recognize it in its pure form. With all the consequences, you don't modify it in terms of the constitution, and you allow Muslims to judge their own marriages. You allow for arbitration, or you create Sharia courts where Muslims are uh, are presiding qualified people, and they will have uh, the right to make decisions. So you give them complete freedom. You give complete freedom to Muslims where they are entitled to enforce their laws in accordance with the Quran and Sunnah, and entitled to do so by recognized ulama bodies. Arbit- uh, arbitration tribunals or a Sharia court which has been created. Uh, the other system is no, that's not possible. So we're going to recognize Muslim marriages, we're going to force parliament to regulate it, and we're going to let the secular courts decide all of these marital issues, maintenance, proprietary consequences, custody, obligations after dissolution, grounds for dissolution, all of this. And among this, many, many questions arise. Who is a Muslim? Uh, you know, that in itself is going to uh, play out in the courts. What happens if somebody believes in gay marriages and they say it's justified in terms of their version or interpretation of the scriptures? You have, you have uh, crazy people today who come up with all sorts of nonsense arguments to that effect. Uh, what's going to happen then with all of these things and how is the, co- how are the courts going to interpret Muslim marriages and, and, and give it effect? They're actually going to land up 
uh, changing it and secularizing it. And, and so that's the heart of the, the problem that we face. And that's the heart of this case. And that's what the Constitutional Court is to decide whether this order is going to be confirmed or not. So I've tried to summarize the history. And I, I think we'll, in the next part, we'll get Brother Yusuf to look at some of the principal uh, issues involved in this tension that uh, I hope I've tried to make clear. Jazakallah, it's been a bit long, but it had that long history. But it wasn't long. It was brilliant indeed. And I can tell you the conundrum. Hey, you put me in a conundrum, but you are, and, you know, you, you're filling it up, uh, us in so beautifully. And we're really enjoying uh, it, uh, you know, advocate of Firoz Boda. Allah bless you for that. Time for us to go for a break. And when we get back, inshallah, advocate uh, Yusuf uh, Dokrat will be giving us his, uh, uh, his uh, summary also, or his points of view on uh, this critical issue. Let's go take a break. You're listening to a Marcus Sahaba online radio podcast. Still having a fantastic conversation uh, with our advocate, uh, Firoz Boda. And uh, yes, uh, I tell you, Attorney Yusuf Dokras is <coughs> going to take a, a limelight now. Recognizing a Muslim personal law in a circular state, conflict and uh, contradictions. And I tell you, uh, uh, Attorney uh, Yusuf uh, Dokrat, uh, our our advocate really, he laid down, you know, the, uh, he summarized it so beautifully. Uh, it, it makes for fascinating listening to uh, to us as uh, the ordinary layman or the person that's uh, listening to this. And, you know, adultery is uh, not punished, but polygamy is punished. Uh, things like that staying in the back of my mind, uh, talking about the different mazhabs, brilliant indeed. Uh, the principles are that are um, governing this. Uh, what are the different the pr- the principles, the principal uh, objections? Uh, perhaps uh, you're going to fill us in on that, uh, Attorney Yusuf uh, Dokrat. Uh, bismillah. Yes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah wa rahim uh, Thanks, Shafar. Just, um, just flowing from from uh, your comments, uh, the, the example that uh, you used that Firoz had, had raised about uh, criminalizing a failure to register the lark and then allowing and not criminalizing an act that uh, uh, Allah Azza considers uh, a heinous crime. Uh, perhaps that's a good place to start because what it does is it reflects um, quite profoundly this incredible difference in values between Dinul Islam in any other system, and in our discussion for our purposes, the secular system. And this clash of values plays itself out uh, in the life of Muslims living under the rule of secular law uh, on a daily basis. Um, And we find ourselves constantly having to check our conduct, but more importantly, check our mindset uh, in relation to why we do certain things, what approach we take to certain things, what informs those decisions. And, and Brother Shafar, this is, this is something we may have alluded to in previous discussions, but it's something that is the, the thread that weaves through our lives that we've got to be very clear about. What do we mean when we say we are Muslim? What does it mean to be a Muslim? And this issue of identity will affect everything else that we do and think in our lives. Absolutely everything comes from how we understand who we are. So if you have a person who says, I'm a person who is governed, who believes that the Constitution uh, is the ultimate set of values uh, for me, then you know what decisions that person is going to take in relation to most things. If you have a person who says, I'm a Muslim and I believe that there is one Allah and that the Prophet ﷺ is the final messenger, then you know that this person is going to be infused with that sense of identity as a prism from which to view everything that takes place. And why is that important in our discussion? It's because when we speak about Muslim personal law, Sharia uh, versus secular law, let's give the Sharia its proper estimation and its proper status. This is the law of Allah Azza wa Jalla. This is not the law of you and I. This is not the law 
of esteemed professors. This is not the law of activists. This is not the laws of justice seekers. This is the law of the Lord of Lords. This is the law, the, the law that Allah Azza wa Jal has seen fit to place upon the earth for insan to follow. And if we don't recognize that supremacy, if we don't recognize that autonomy that Allah has in relation to his law, we will get lost in the debate trying to reconcile Sharia with a system that denies Allah. You cannot, you cannot reconcile the two systems. Their philosophical premise, their value premise is completely apart. So as a, as a kind of textual example for you, Brother Shafar, if you look at the, the opening words of the Constitution, um, it, it, it says a number of things, but one of the things it says is, and South Africa belongs to all who live in it. Now, politically that sounds nice, you know, the country belongs to everybody who lives in it. But that in itself is fundamentally opposed to our concept from Al-Quran about ownership of the earth. Does Allah not say that the earth belongs to him? So, so right at the beginning, you have a notion that he's opposed to each other. Does Allah not say to us that he, he rejects any system other than his system? And if we don't appreciate that, we will seek constantly to try and manipulate the principles of our deen in order to make it consistent with another set of values. Now, if I were to say to you, so you, you get people who say, but let's try and find common, common ground between secularism and, and Sharia. You know, don't be, don't be so uncompromising and don't be so extreme in your views. Let's find common grounds. I've already indicated to you why we can't purely from a premise point of view. But let me ask this. Will you ever say, let's find common ground between halal and haram meat? Will you ever say, well, they're not really so different because they both meet? What makes the one despicable and the one pure? What makes the one filth and the other one toyib? Is it not the law of Allah? And so, if I were now to say, all right, so let's, let's change the law of Zaba and let's change this because it needs to be constitutionally acceptable, X, Y, and Z, are we going to allow that? Of course not. We're never going to allow it. So why are we entertaining the discussion on a watered-down version of a law that we have no right to interfere with, the law of Allah. Why, we, why do we even begin to entertain that discussion? One of the problems that one has living under the law, under a law other than the law of Allah, is not to recognize the fact that Sharia, its primary sources being Quran and Hadith and then all the other accepted principles that flow from fiqh, is a multifaceted, extremely complex, superbly crafted, independent system that cannot be placed under a system that purports to regulate the same things in people's lives. We don't think of the Sharia as this incredibly complex system. We have a tradition of scholars, scholars who, who had spent the greater part of their lives. And when we say the greater part of their lives, we actually mean the greater part of their lives. 10, 15, 20 hours a day without sleep, studying in Salah, seeking guidance debating, trying to understand all of these issues. And we think, as people living in South Africa in 2021, that we can just kind of flip through one or two articles and say, ah, I think that scholar was a patriarch. And that is just incredibly presumptuous of us. It's deeply arrogant of us to take away from this deen the incredible richness of our jurisprudence. 
and to seek to place the jurisprudence under a constitution that has absolutely nothing in common with this deed. And then to have the temerity to say that we're doing it because it will serve the interests of justice. Is that adul? Is that fist? Is that justice? How can that be justice? How can the mellowed down version of the Sharia, or even worse, the perverted version of the Sharia ever bring justice to a society? So, Brother Shafat, we saw this happening in the last 18 months where so much of how we view legislation, how we view the world, how we view what is happening, is influenced by our identity and the way in which we view uh, the deen of Allah and the Sharia. So, what are the conflicts? The conflicts are not only profound, they're not only manifold, they pervade every area. Because Tawheed pervades every area every single area of Sharia and disbelief pervades every single area of secular law. How do you want to merge them? How do you want to sit and say, I can be... So, so we hear, for example, in Europe, the, 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 the volume of the French government saying, we want people who are Muslim to espouse and openly commit themselves to having French values. Now, rightfully, we find that offensive because we know that French values, in the way that they understand French values, is diametrically opposed to the values of Islam. Do we want to place ourselves in in the same situation without being compelled to do so, where we start saying, our deen is such that we are able to embrace the values of something completely foreign to Islam? We can't do that. And we must recognize what we are doing it. And we must take it seriously. Because with this is not simply a question about individual lives. This is a question about Aqeedah that is going to have a, an incredibly profound effect on the present society and our descendants. What do we want them to inherit? A system where that is called Muslim personal law, but but if you dig beneath the veneer of Muslim and Islam, is in fact nothing like it. Do we want them to inherit that? And to then, for the rest of their lives, believe, and this is what happens when legislation is there long enough. It gets legitimacy. This is what happens when consultations take place with state authorities and so on and so forth. You legitimize the process. And then are you going to legitimize that process and then be grateful because now you've got rid of patriarchy from Sharia? Is that what you really want to achieve? We need as an ummah to understand that the only distinction that is relevant for our lives is the distinction of belief and disbelief. And that manifests itself in the most visual and noticeable way in legislation. And when we choose secular law over Sharia law, we are committing a grave offense. And when we, when we claim to be introducing a degree of Sharia law under the secular law and achieving the very opposite, then our f- offense is in fact more culpable. So, Shafat, I hope that in some way um, establishes how critical a question this is that all Muslim brothers and sisters in South Africa need to think about. Think very carefully about it. We must make dua to Allah that we do not get caught in worshipping our own minds, thinking that we are so clever that 1500 years on, we understand things about Sharia that the great scholars of Islam didn't. That we understand things about Sharia that the Sahaba didn't. We need to get rid of this arrogance that is beginning to creep into the society. And if we can do that, and if we can come back to the question of Tawheed, and give 
Allah his true estimation and give his law his true estimation then inshallah Allah will have mercy on us Firoz I, I think maybe you can add to that substance that you need to Okay, uh, Firoz, before you get into that, you know, I, I want to compliment uh, our attorney Yusuf Dokrat for being, you know, so concise also, just like you, both of you compliment each other. He talks about the Kalima being the identity and, you know, the law of the law of Lord. I love that, a beautiful line that one time, you know, uh, it, it, it actually outdoes Shakespeare or whatever work you do, but the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you remind me of an anecdote which states, the things of this world, proceeds by divine decree and not by man's administration. And, you know, you said it eloquently again, we cannot reconcile the circular and the divine law. Definitely, divine decree will supersede all. People say, let's uh, find a common ground. I love that uh, between uh, circularism and Islam. Virtually impossible. And you give the example of halal and haram. You know, meat, you can, halal meat is halal meat. How can you find a common ground? Eh? Bacon and bacon, or you can't do that. Halal is halal and haram is haram. So you cannot find uh, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, the middle ground. You go on to say scholars who spent hours in jurisprudence under divine law, praying, meditating to implement Allah's law on this earth in accordance to the Quran and the Sunnah. We cannot have this watered down. Neither can we have it uh, judged on or judged by people that don't know nothing about the deen and who, you know, some maybe just read the paragraph on the something and they think they know it all. That can never be. And you brought in the French values uh, diametrically opposed to Islam. This is a question of Akira which will have an impact on our descendants. And Alhamdulillah, we should be defending it. We need as an ummah to realize that there is a major difference between Belief and disbelief. Beautiful indeed. Advocate uh, Firoz Boza, uh, your comments. Jazakallah khair. I mean, Yusuf has expressed uh, the conflict in so graphic terms uh, by, by that example. And you see that type of conflict playing out. And we'll give some examples uh, also of, uh, you know, the conflict playing out w- with respect to the, uh, the, the, the order that the Supreme Court of Appeal made. A little later on, but 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 let me. I just want to add uh, to to certain things that uh, Yusuf said about, you know, our approach to matters of this uh, nature. Uh, so so what is at stake, and what you know, what is being compromised uh, in the process? And really, uh, I mean, this is the this is the fight of Deen, the fight of Islam versus Kufr, the fight of darkness versus light, the fight of truth versus falsehood. We are Muslims because we believe that the deen is true and we submit to the deen. And when we say we submit to the deen, we don't submit to the dictates of our opinion, of our cleverness, uh, or the opinion of, uh, of, of, of anyone else other than Allah and His Rasul and what our scholars have agreed on uh, in the past as, as being ijma. Uh, uh, inter- and, 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 and that portion of the law was simply there to give effect to uh, the Quran and Sunnah. Uh, so, so I, I want to pick up on certain material differences between secular law and Islamic law, uh, uh, just from a, from a uh, you know from a uh, shall I say theological perspective. So, so the first difference is the purpose of law itself is very different uh, in a Sharia system uh, versus uh, a secular system, uh, and, and all of these reasons will go to why the two cannot be married or, 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 or matched or, or even uh, harmonized. So, in, in, a, in a secular system, I mean, all law, all law uh, is there to attempt to serve uh, justice. But the notion of what justice is and the concept of justice, a secular justice, Islamic justice. Uh, is very different, and the, and the primary reason for this difference is this. In order to understand anything in Islamic law, uh, any fiqh or any rule or any uh, rule, for example, the rule against adultery, in order to make, to make sense of it and, and to understand it from an Islamic perspective, you can only make sense of it if you believe in two worlds, this world and the next world. So, so you believe that this world is a medium to get to the next world and that true life, true accountability, 
true justice will be served on the day of Kiyama, and what you do in this world will will ultimately depend, will ultimately determine, uh, subject to Allah's will, of course, uh, what will happen to you in the year after. And in the year after, we know as Muslims, we believe in uh, 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 heaven and we believe in hell. And that's where, where we'll end up. We'll either be in one of those two places. Uh, ultimately, we'll, we'll serve uh, in, in, in the dungeons of hell or we'll serve in the, in, in, in the beautiful gardens of Jannah. So every law in Islam has has a diff- very different purpose to secular law. Every law in Islam serves to drive its citizens away from Jahannam and into Jannah. That is the purpose of law in Islam. So why is adultery uh, uh, criminalized in Islam with a harsh punishment? Obviously, there's a very strict standard of proof. Uh, why is there a hurt punishment for theft? Why is there a hurt punishment for uh for robbery and for murder, uh, provided the Islamic requirements are fulfilled. Because all of these acts are heinous sins in the eyes of Allah and could lead you to destruction in the year after. So the reason that you have laws uh, and the le- a reason that, that laws are passed in an Islamic system are, 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 are there not only to look after the welfare of the citizens in the dunya, but more importantly, to ensure that they are that, 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 that they are driven. Uh, that's the task of the ruler, to, the ruler to drive his citizens into Jannah if he can, to move them towards Jannah and away from Jahannam. So the purpose of Islamic law is not only to look after the welfare of those people in the dunya, but to attempt to look after and safeguard their welfare in the akhirah. And so when you have these two systems one believing in the hereafter and one negating the hereafter, one believing in Allah and one negating Allah, one believing in Jannah and Jahannam and one negating Jannah and Jahannam, one believe, believing on the day of Qiyamah and one negating a day of Qiyamah, you cannot harmonize them. The one is truth and the other is falsehood. So so the, perp- the very purpose of Islamic law and all of the rules that we have in the Quran is ultimately to submit ourselves to Allah's law and to submit and to be good Muslims so that we uh, 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 are secure in the hereafter. So all of the rules that we have in the Sharia, family law, criminal law, commercial law, all of them have this two-worldly outlook. And there's no way a secular judge will ever be able to appreciate the wisdom of anything in the Sharia without believing in Allah and believing in the in the day of accountability and believing in, in the year after. So that that is the first uh, primary difference between the two systems at at a very conceptual level. The second difference is about authority. Who who has ultimate authority? Now, in the secular system, uh, uh, in the secular. System, Uh, that have, has ultimate authority in the form of the ruling party. In the Islamic system, there's Allah who has ultimate authority. And I'm going to read something uh, by one of the scholars, Mulana Farhad, w- which captures this point so beautifully about the competition for power in a secular versus in a, in a religious Islamic system. And he says the following with reference to MPL. I want to, I want to, I want to give this quote and another quote from another book to illustrate the point about the competition for, for true authority and the making of law. And he says the following, whatever the justifications and challenges, ultimately the proposal and attempt in the article that is to promote MPL legislation is to take divine law selectively by our whims or, or, or even if totality, and place it under the jurisdiction of secular law. Now, the reality of the universe is that Allah created it by himself, takes care of it by himself, and holds it accountable to himself. He has made his obedience incumbent on the universe. He and only he decides what is right and what is wrong. He has precisely dictated what is expected and obligatory upon his creation. He makes the law. The secularist, and all those who do not submit to his law are competitors to Allah on the earth. 
in that they wish to draw the obedience of Allah's creation to themselves instead of to their true master. They are therefore the enemies of Allah. It is therefore easy to understand why subjugation of Allah's law, while sanctified as Allah's law in part or whole, to other than Allah, is a sacrilege of His law and is an act of blasphemy. If certain categories of Allah's law or even one law can be subjugated to other than Allah, then why not more categories or more of His laws? With what then is the meaning of establishing the lordship of Allah on the earth? So there's a competition for power. We believe Allah is in control and they believe the government is in control. The second essential difference about, about legislative authority uh, in, in modern systems versus Islamic systems is this. Uh, and, and this is uh, taken from a book by Abdul Hakim Murad, Traveling Home, where he points out that classical Sharia agrees that the ruler has virtually no control over legislation. God's law is found, interpreted, and actualized by the Muslim populace through their expert representatives who are the ulama, who must, as a matter of necessity, be independent of the ru- ruler. So, so what he's saying is that in Islam, you never had a system where the ruler would make law, interpret law, or enact law through legislation. You don't find this... You find this very late when the Ottomans took over and uh, uh, vast parts of the earth and codified the Sharia law. But if you look at the, the, the times of the Falafai Roshidin, they never legislated and had legislative councils and codified Muslim personal law into a statute. Well, why didn't they do that? Because it was never the role of the ruler to dictate to people what the law is. Because the law is already dictated by Allah. And so it was simply for the jurists to apply the law on a case-by-case basis to give justice to the party. So the very notion, the very notion of codifying Muslim personal law into a statute, and now not even in a Muslim system, but in a system where, where uh, uh, people who just believe in Islam are doing the codification, is completely foreign to Islam. The whole political system is uh, foreign to Islam. So that's the second, the second key uh, difference conceptually. Uh, we'll take a break, Brother Shafar. I want to highlight two other two other uh, uh, key differences, and then we can get into the detail, inshallah. Inshallah, jazakallah khair for that, uh, Advocate Feroz Boda. Yes, it's time for us to take a break and go for the Isha Azan, and inshallah, we will continue after that. You are listening to Marcus Sahaba Online Radio Podcast. A welcoming of pious and sagacious ummah after the Isha Azan. With a hearty assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Advocate Firoz Boda with me and also our attorney Yusuf Dokrat, both giving us a brilliant uh, input of this evening, recognition of Muslim personal law in a circular state, conflict and uh, contradiction. That before the break, uh, Advocate Firoz Boda very eloquently, you know, he spoke about fight between uh, uh, light and darkness, and always light will come to the fore, and we submit uh, to the Quran and the Sunnah of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, you know, Atiullah wa Atiul Rasul. We believe that we use uh, the medium of this world to go into the next world, either, you know, entering heaven or ha- hell. We are a physical being having, a, 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 you know, a, a physical being uh, that, or a spiritual being having a physical experience, but we'll go back to our spiritual world, inshallah. And he talks about heinous uh, sins are mentioned as a warning. So believers will abstain and gain divine blessings. And those that negate Allah's law will never appreciate Allah, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deep blessings on us and his guidance and his mercy on us. To disobey Allah's law is at a time call, it can actually lead to blasphemy. And uh, the ruler uh, and uh, you know, during the time of the Khalifa or the or the Sahaba, anhum, the ruler never dictated uh, the law, or because Allah's decree was followed, divine decree was followed. Uh, Advocate Firoz Boda, you know, you were mashallah, uh, conscientizing us. Uh, uh, proceed, Bismillah. So, so I was dealing with the second point about legislative authority and the com- com- the, the competition for for legislative authority and. You know, and, and, and the point that, uh, that the two scholars made, but I want to just carry on reading from what Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad said about the very idea uh, of, of legislating uh, Muslim personal law into statutes being inimical to the way law was practiced by our, uh, our communities 
And he says, uh, in, in the classical Sharia, local communities were expected to be largely self-regulating. Uh, by contrast, following the British Raj's decision in the 19th century to turn personal status elements of Sharia law into, st- into statutory laws, Western educated Muslims slowly adopted the idea of religious law as something to be interpreted and enacted by the legislature of a nation state. The result has been systematic failure everywhere. Together with a substantial loss of the Sharia's diversity, the madhab system, and the independence enhanced the moral authority of many ulama. Every Muslim polity which has attempted to westernize Islamic, Islam's ethical legal vision by reinventing Sharia as statutory law has created a totalitarian ideological state which by turning Islam into a proserectian bed in the longer term becomes a tragic Ridistan in a global energizer of the fear. Uh, in, 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 uh, so, so, so th- that is so beautifully captured by Sheikh Abdul uh, Akim Murad as to why uh, it is completely inimical, in, inimical to the flexibility of how Sharia operates, to the role of the ulama who are who are the custodians of the law, uh, uh, because the law is already enacted. It is for them, after years of study, to apply the law based on their knowledge, based on particular circumstances of a case, and to give rulings uh, on a case-by-case basis, uh, which is which is uh, which which are, uh, results in flexibility and, and, and diversity, and allows justice to be met out in given situations. The very notion of now codifying the law into a statute and asking judges to now interpret the statute takes away this flexibility that the ulama have, and in fact, usurps their role. Those people who are punting for legislation have a problem with our ulama making decisions on the basis of sharia. They have problems because some of them have feminist beliefs that men who are in in, in the position of ulama can't be just, which is really uh, completely inimicable to our values because nothing makes a man uh, incapable of doing justice to a woman uh, when he's applying the law of Allah objectively. As women can uh, do justice, so men can do justice. You, uh, and, and, but they have a fundamental problem. They want to take away the power of the ulama to, to make uh, 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 judgments on a case-by-case basis uh, in the community and transfer it to the political judiciary in this country. And that is completely inimicable to, to Islamic law. The third, the third fundamental difference between secular law and Islamic law, is that secular law believes in the notion that values change from time to time. So uh, so if you look at uh, uh, in the 80s, there was the concept worldwide almost of the marital power, the husband being in, in charge of the family unit. It was also a recognized thing in South African law. It was only abolished recently. The kawam of the man was something that was recognized in the family unit in all systems, but because of liberalism, uh, because of the idea that values change, because of the idea that man is progressing and that the old values are archaic, there's a there's a there's a belief uh, that uh, that everything needs to be reevaluated. So all everything we believe in, hold on tight to, has to be re- reevaluated. So, in, for example, today, uh, liberals are questioning the idea of who a man and a woman is. They're questioning the concept of gender. They're saying that gender is not determined by your physical uh, features. Uh, but, uh, but a man can inside be a woman today and a man tomorrow. And a woman can be a man because gender is determined not by uh, your physical features, but by your mind or your state of mind. So even the, to, today they're questioning the role of gender. They're questioning the concept of marriage. The, the, the concept of marriage in Islam is between a man and a woman because Allah has created them in pairs because Allah has chosen to create a man and, uh, and a woman and to worship him in the ways that he's prescribed that they should worship him. Today, they change the concept of marriage and say a man and a man can get married and a woman and a woman can get married. And they're also going to, uh, 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 in future, accept 
I have to accept because of the liberal mindset that a man, a woman, a cat, a dog, a mother, a father can all have one marriage and all can become a spouse because they have decided contractually to carry on uh, and engage in this marriage and they're going to ask for legal recognition. And they're going to then later on ask for legal recognition of marriages between brother and sister and they're going to ask for legal recognition of marriages between mother and father, uh, I mean mother and son and daughter and father. So, because they believe in the concept of changing values. In Islam, our values are the same. Allah created man and has not changed the value system. So, when we look for our values, we look backwards. Because the Quran tells us that the earliest nations will be, there will be more of the earliest nations in Jannah than the, than, the, than the later nations. Because they understood what Allah wanted from them better than us. And when we asked, when, when, the, when the Prophet Wasallam sought to guide us, he said to, to the people, follow my Sahaba. Follow any Sahaba like, like, like stars in the sky. And he said, follow the three generations after me. Follow, uh, and all our four Imams come from, from that generation. All, all, of, all of the schools of Mazhab come from that generation. Because they understood Islam in its pure form and practiced it. The, the Sahaba first. The Tabi'in, then the Tabi'in, Tabi'in. We look at them to, to, uh, to, to, uh, determine our values because we understand that they understood the Quran, they understood the prophetic practice in a purer sense than we can understand it now. So when we search for values, we look back. When they search for values, they look forward. So the two are completely oil and water. You cannot blend secularism with Islam. The two are completely incompatible. And ultimately, uh, what, what, what does this ultimately conclude? Uh, be, be, uh, and, and, and really, although the, although the systems are different, our test is the same. What were the, uh, the, the, the generations of Muslims after the Prophet Wasallam? what were they tested with? They were tested with one thing. If you look at history, with the protection of the purity of the deen. That's what they were tested with. That is the eternal test of a Muslim. So if you look at the time, for example, of uh, Abu Hanifa or Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, all of them were hanging fast onto the rope of Allah and to the principles of the Quran and Sunnah against the wishes of the ruler. They always separated themselves from the ruler because they knew that the ruler, because of political experiences, will seek to corrupt the deen. And so their task, and the task of the ummah was to hold firm to the principles established in our deen by the Quran and the prophetic practices and the earlier generations of Muslims. And that test was carried on when, uh, when Imam Ahmad, for example, they were confronted with this idea that the Quran was created and therefore fallible. And this was an idea mooted by the rulers because they they wanted to claim political authority uh, to determine what is right and wrong. And they wanted to make laws that trump the Quran because they believed that because it was created, it may have mistakes. And Imam, Imam Ahmed stood up at the pain of imprisonment and some of his colleagues were put to death. And he stood up and he said, I'm going to protect the Sharia. I'm going to protect the status of the Quran. I'm going to protect the, 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 the status of the Sunnah and the Hadith. I'm not going to change one thing. And if they're going to put me to death, so be it. I'm going to stand fast and hold on to the rope of Allah. And that test is, uh, if you look at the generations of, of, uh, of tests that the Muslim Ummah has faced, that test has been a consistent test. Every Muslim, has a duty to protect and uphold the Sharia, to stand firm on its principles, and to make sure that we will never compromise the deen under any circumstances. And we are prepared with, with the will of Allah to give up everything for the protection of deen. And many people who, who punt for changes in the deen forget, forget that the, the first maqasid of the Sharia, the greatest role of law in the Sharia, is the protection of the Sharia, even before life. So that is why, for example, sometimes you have to, uh, jihad is compulsory for the protection of, of deen. So deen, the protection of deen is the first duty of a Muslim. And, th- and that is what we are here on this earth to do. And that's why these, these tests that we confront in modern times, that we've been speaking about before, the test of uh, closing masajids, who's got the authority to do that, changing the way we make salah, splitting the serfs, and now uh, uh, creating 
new personal laws which are completely foreign to the laws enacted uh, uh, by by our uh, by the by, by the by the Quran and the and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All of that is a consistent test, and it's for us to hold on to the. Hot, like hot coals, we, we, we're going to have to hold on to this dean because that is our true challenge. And, and, and inshallah, that was just to take forward what Brother Yusuf has said. I don't know if he wants to add anything uh, to what I said, Brother Shafar. Then I'll give you maybe some examples of the of the bill to illustrate, oh, sorry, of the order to illustrate some tensions. Yeah, you know, Firoz, I'd like to uh, emboss what you said, and uh, I'd love uh, Yusuf to uh, even uh, comment on that. You know, the ulama are the custodians that will apply the law and allow justice uh, according to divine decree. Beautiful indeed. And perhaps uh, the circular law uh, wants uh, to take the ulama out of the equation, out of jurisprudence, and they want to put in uh, their agenda. And, you know, today you can see the the circularists uh, deliberately want to question everything which, uh, you know, opposes uh, them and oppose uh, the agenda that they have. They love to bulldoze the uh, divine decree. And uh, when uh, uh, the uh, and when we search for values, as uh, Advocate Firoz Boda said, when we search for values, we look back, we look at the Quran, we look at the Sunnah, we look at the Zahabas, we look, and when the secularists, when they look forward uh, to their thing, they uh, they move forward bulldozing divine decree and implementing a godless society. They're taking, you know, Allah out of the equation. They're taking away uh, people and they're bringing them into this hedonistic world, this world of uh, materialism. We're going back to paganism. They're all going back to paganism. And uh, Advocate says it so eloquently when he says, stand fast and obey the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every Muslim should defend the deen and protect the deen. And this is why we are here. And perhaps, inshallah, we are being documented as those this evening are defending the deen. May Allah accept that from us.